The Gavi you tend to see borespina is under threat from a variety of things like climate change, housing developments, mining operations, but perhaps most insidiously, wild collection, both legal and illegal. And so what can we do as, as collectors and as me as an agave utensis nerd do to protect this amazing, amazing plant? So that's what we're gonna be talking about in this video, something I call Project Eborospina and what I'm going to do to try to protect these Eborospina plants out in habitat. So we've talked about uh, the problems facing agave utensis on this channel a few times before. and Generally that takes the form of, of wild harvesting agave utensis, that is people digging up agave utensis from the wild to sell into the marketplace, be that illegally in the form of poaching or be that legally but perhaps unethically. Right? Um, and of all the varieties, of all the taxa of agave utensis that is most likely the one that's the most under threat is agave utensis eborospina. And the reasons for that are simple, straightforward. Basically, there's two reasons. One is just that that's the most desired one. That's the one that sells for the most in the marketplace, has the most people wanting it in the marketplace because it's got the, you know, the coolest, the most elaborate spines and teeth and all that kind of stuff. It's the, it's the favorite on Instagram, et cetera. And, and the other problem facing it, and the other reason that it's probably the one that's most under threat is simply because it's probably the most rare form of agave utensis, right? It's, it's the one with the, 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 the lowest number of documented populations populations compared to Nevadensis or, you know, regular regular utensis or even Cababensis. Um, and it's probably got the lowest population size, although in a little bit in this video we're going to talk about problems and challenges facing the estimation of population size. And so the problem of the threat of wild collecting, of digging up Eborospina in the wild, um, may cause two damages, two kinds of damage to the Eborospina populations. One is simply decreasing that already probably pretty small population size, just in sheer numbers, and that numbers will just be fewer agave utensis Eborospina in the world. But then two, and probably most damagingly in the long term, uh, is a reduction in genetic diversity, right? Because when people go out and, and, and if they know what they're doing, if they're familiar with the marketplace, they're gonna be looking for specific traits, you know, like merged spined agaves, which we've talked about and shown on this channel before, particularly long spined agave utensis, borospina, et cetera. So when those poachers or even legal but unethical wild harvesting is happening, they may be targeting specific genetic traits, specifically desirable traits, which uh, could lead to a loss of genetic diversity. And in fact, I've heard some stories uh, about, you know, specific sort of legendary locations where uh, in the past, many, maybe half or more of the plants in that habitat, in that specific little area, had a trait called merged spines. That's, and again, we've talked about that merged spines. That's when the, you know, you got those really wide spines down the, down the terminal, from the terminal spines to the teeth of the plant. Um, you know, in this population, there were a bunch of plants, like I said, half or maybe more, that previously showed those merged spines. But because that's such a desirable trait to folks who would go out and dig these plants up to sell them, now when you go to visit that same location, there's a lot fewer of these merged spine plants in that habitat. I've also heard stories of, you know, merged, or excuse me, uh, crested plants disappearing uh, from habitat, etc. So there are two bad things that could basically be happening to agave utensis borospina populations because of wild harvesting. One is simply just a reduction in overall population size, but then the other is the elimination uh, of, of really desirable traits from habitat, from the gene pool, resulting in a loss of genetic diversity. So then the next question is, okay, we understand that there's probably a threat to agave utensis borospina, but, but what can I do? What can, you know, you as the viewer and then what can I do uh, as myself, as a big agave utensis nerd, uh, actually do? And I think there's sort of two sides to the coin of what we can do to protect agave utensis eborospina. And I, well, I talked a little bit about this with Kelly Griffin when I interviewed him, but basically there's, you know, on the supply side, right? You can buy and support and grow agave utensis from seed, right? You can make sure you're only buying seed grown plants. And I've talked about in other videos uh, on this channel about how to tell if a plant is seed grown or if it's been harvested from the wild, but you can just make sure that you're only buying seed grown plants because that means that A, there's gonna be more agave utensis in the world and not less, and B, you're also protecting genetic diversity, right? If you're, you know, and this, this is where one of my questions, one of my challenges to folks who are big on tissue culture comes, is that 
If we put a plant into tissue culture, like you know we're seeing in with agave uh, harvested for tequila in Mexico, uh, that will result in a loss of genetic diversity, right? Seed growing plants uh, in cultivation is the only way to ensure that you know the collector's market is getting both the plants they want and the genetic diversity that the overall populations uh, deserve while you know increasing population sizes overall. So there's the seed grown thing. So if you want to protect agave yeast census at home, the, the best thing you can do uh, is generally just to make sure that you're only buying seed grown plants, only supporting folks who are growing from seed uh, because that will protect genetic diversity and population size. The other thing that can be done, um, and right now I think a lot of this work uh, is on folks like me who are Gavi Utensis nerds, but hopefully in the future some of it will be on just sort of collectors and, and folks who care about genetic diversity and you know in, in endangered plant species in the wild, and that is actually trying to protect these plants in habitat. So there's a great example. There's a law in California where uh, you know dudleyas are protected from wild harvesting, and so to do more in southern Nevada, where I live, you know, around Las Vegas, where a lot of Eborospina plants grow, uh, we should probably have some sort of uh, legislative measures in place to protect agave utensis, you know, maybe to regulate the sale of them or to the, regulate the harvesting of them, even when it's done legally, to make sure it's done ethically and sustainably and all that kind of stuff. And so that's at the, the local level, right? Protecting, you know, the agave utensis eborospina that lives in southern Nevada. And eborospina is primarily, with only a few exceptions, a southern Nevada variety. The other side of that is something called CITES listing. Now CITES is an international treaty, a body of basically international law, that places plants and animals uh, in different appendixes based on how threatened they are by um, illegal harvesting and, and the international trade, right? And there's, there's appendix one, two, and three essentially, and plants or animals that are listed in appendix one, basically there, there is no uh, legal trade in them. You can't legally ship these plants across uh, you know, international borders. Um, number two, you can, but there's a lot of restrictions on them in Appendix 2 plants listed in Appendix 2. Um, and in and, and Appendix 3, uh, you can, but there are a slightly less um, restrictions on them, basically. So plants or animals listed in Appendix 1 are those believed to be the most endangered and the most at risk, and so there's the most restrictions on whether or not they can travel across uh, international borders, down to three where those are the plants and animal species that we should probably keep an eye on, we should probably have some insight into where the plants that are shipping across international borders are coming from and how that's being done, uh, but there isn't just a total ban on that. So the entire family of plants in cactus, cactaceae, uh, is listed in CITES Appendix 2. So there are, uh, you know, a number of restrictions on how they can travel across international borders. But when it comes to agave, there are only a few species that are actually protected by CITES at all. Notably, agave utensis is not listed in CITES currently at all. But there has been some talk, and I've talked to some folks who work in conservation and make these kinds of recommendations, experts in the field, uh, about listing agave utensis in one of the appendixes, uh, appendices uh, of CITES. You know, either the whole species of agave utensis or a specific variety of agave utensis, namely Eborospina in CITES, to, to give it some protection um, against, you know, the, the trade in illegally or unethically collected plants in the international market, right? So on the protecting plants in habitat side, there's, there's, there's again, there's that's one side of the total coin, and then in, on that one side, there's two more sides, it's like a fractal coin, I guess. Um, there's protecting them domestically here in Southern Nevada, uh, by passing laws or legislation similar to what happened for the Dudley or Joshua trees in California. Uh, and then there's also what can be done on the international level by uh, listing it in something like an ascites appendix. One of the most important pieces of information that will help us you know, be able to determine whether or not we can protect it either on the local or the international level uh, is population size. Right, to, to, in order to be able to protect a plant, we have to have some understanding that it is endangered, that population sizes are small or rapidly decreasing, um, and, and that you know, this legislation will do something to protect what's happening to it, right? And so what I've tried to do in some of my work when I'm out in the field is document as many cases as I can, which have been very few so far, of what looks like agave yute sand is poaching. Basically, um, you know, if I see plants that look like they've been dug up, you know, I video that, I photograph that, I make videos about that, 
that, I post about it, etc. Um, and, and so on one hand, you know, there's hope that if we can document more cases of poaching and, and digging up plants in the wild, even if it's, you know, legal but potentially unethical or unsustainable, then perhaps we can protect it locally. Um, and then maybe, you know, from there we can talk about protecting it internationally. The other side of that coin is understanding whether or not total population sizes are small, are they large, are they decreasing for agave utensis borospina. And unfortunately, there is actually no current uh, understanding, there is no existing reasonable estimation for the total number of agave utensis borospina plants in the wild. And so this is where something I'm calling Project Eborospina comes into play. I've set, my, I've set for myself a goal to create a reasonable, you know, statistically defensible estimation of the total number of agave utensis Eborospina plants in habitat in Southern Nevada. And so to accomplish this goal, basically there's two kinds of output that I would hope to produce from this Project Eborospina. One is a visual recording of these agave utensis Eborospina populations, be that both video and photographic. And then the other one is that statistically defensible numeric estimation of just exactly how many and it'll be an estimation based on surveys, and we'll talk about the methodology in a second, but basically answering the question, how many agave utensis Eborospina plants actually are living in the wild right now? And that's a, that's a pretty big goal, that's a pretty big project, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot that I bit off to chew. And so I'm gonna have to approach it in steps. The first step is, and part of the preparation that I've started to do now, is basically to identify as many potential populations of agave utensis borospina as I can. As, as we've talked about before, they grow up in sky islands, which often end up being discrete populations, right? Separated by vast miles of low, hot desert floor that they can't live in. So there are, you know, there isn't just one big population spread across you know many many miles of its habitat there's basically a bunch of individual habitats on individual ridge lines peaks mountain slopes etc uh, and um, what I've been doing is going through uh, both the documentation right there are you know books like Howard Scott Gentry's which I talk about every week it sounds like uh, agaves of continental North America which was written in the 80s that has a list of some of the most well documented uh, agave utensis borospina population locations um, and then you know newer research that's been done and published in places like cactus and succulent uh, society of america journal um, as well as just talking to you know folks uh, that are experienced and have gone out and visited plants like this in the field like kelly for instance that i interviewed a couple of weeks ago and of these lists of this list of locations for agave utensis borospina i've basically broken it down into into three categories one is documented and confirmed, meaning that uh, it is documented in one of the aforementioned sources, you know, in some herbarium collection that Gentry listed in his book, or, you know, in some other collection that, you know, was found after Gentry published his book that was published in, like I said, the, the, the Cactus and Succulent Journal, uh, and confirmed, meaning I've actually talked to somebody uh, who knows what they're talking about and has visited this population and says, yes, there are agave utensils there and they are Eborospina. And then the second category is just documented but unconfirmed. There are a few listings that I have found in the documentation um, that indicate that there should be agave utensis borospina in certain locations, but I have not personally talked to anybody who has seen these populations and can confirm that they're borospina. And I'm personally a little dubious of them, just sort of based on the location, the altitude, the geological substrate, all that kind of stuff. So those are documented populations, but they're unconfirmed. And then there's a third category that I'm actually probably the most excited about. The whole thing is very exciting to me, but which is undocumented uh, and confirmed, but I believe are likely populations. There are a number of ridge lines and outcroppings and stuff that I've identified that I have not visited yet, but I've identified from you know satellite imagery on Google Earth uh, that look like the right altitude, you know, the right direction, like the slope is facing in the right direction. Uh, they're in roughly the right area for Eborospina, uh, and they have the right geological substrate. So when I go to visit those populations, if I find Agave Utensis Eborospina there, uh, that'll be the first time they will have been documented in that area, in that, that population. And the next step in the Project of Borospina will be to take these uh, disparate locations. And, and right now I have nine of them essentially in those three different categories. 
and uh, overlay them with some sort of, of grid, right? Because in order to create a statistically defensible, a reasonable uh, estimation of how many agave utensils borospina plants there are actually in the wild, I can't really go and count every single borospina plant that there is out in that habitat. But there are a number of sampling methodologies, and we'll talk about that in a second, that will allow me to, 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 to measure and count a small number of them in a statistically defensible way, and then estimate from there, okay, the whole population, I measured this many plants in this area, uh, so we can extrapolate from there that the entire population is roughly this size. And so to do that, I have to basically break down those nine or maybe growing list of uh, populations, potential populations, uh, into grids that I will then go out and visit in habitat personally and do the legwork uh, and actually uh, survey. And then the next step will actually be to go out and survey those populations. And that's not um, as easy as just it is to just say it because, again, when I talked to Kelly Griffin about these populations a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that he brought up that I've also noticed as well is that, um, you know, it's it's there's a ridge line and then there's a bunch of miles of hiking usually in pretty harsh terrain usually fairly off trail uh, and then there's another ridge line uh, you know really far away and to visit you know an enough of these to get a uh, an actual sample actual statistical sample of these populations these are going to be pretty intense hikes in some places uh, that'll require you know decently long off off road driving four wheel driving uh, but in almost every case it'll require uh, some pretty uh, intense hiking and and I'm sure there are more populations that I have not been able to get to because they're a mountain removed or another hillside and it's you can only walk so far in your life uh, and in order to do that in any sort of reasonable amount of time uh, that'll be you know something I'm working on between now and then is another preparation is kind of getting myself in shape to actually go and visit these populations and move uh, on foot between them uh, in a reasonably fast amount of time while carrying all the supplies that I need mainly you know uh, my camera uh, water, first aid kit, all that kind of stuff. And then the uh, last step will actually be to, to take the data that I collect, the surveys that I do out in habitat, out in these populations, and actually compile them into a report, you know, including that photographic and video recording, but then also, probably most importantly, that number. What is the, you know, the, the how many agave utensils eborus spina plants actually exist out in the wild? Because like I said, from there, then we can start to talk about, okay, you know, this population is tiny, uh, it's, it's, it's decreasing, and we need to do some more to protect it. And so the methodology to do this, I'm still sort of working on it and figuring out which one specifically is going to be the best but basically like I said I, I'm not going to be able to count every single agave utensils and borospina in every single part of all of these populations of all these habitats but what I am going to do is sample them essentially right lay a grid out over the area where they probably live in each one of these populations and then do what's either called transect sampling or quadrant sampling basically either counting all of the agave utensils in one specific box or counting you know or plotting lines across the population across the habitat and then counting every agave utensils borospina that touches that line and there are sort of pros and cons to both of those and and as I do more preparation over the next couple of months. Uh, I'll be posting more about this both on my Instagram and here on YouTube about Project Eborospina uh, and which one of these sampling methodologies I will be using. And so I'm going to begin the uh, the actual hikes, the actual surveys of these populations in sometime in uh, probably October and then carry that through November. It's super duper hot out there right now. Um, and these are going to be, like I said, long, pretty strenuous hikes. Uh, so I need to wait until the, the the temperatures are a little bit better, a little more conducive to that. But between you know now and then, and in, in the couple of months between now and when I actually start these surveys, uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of work, both in preparing the, uh, the the survey methodology and locating through documentation and through talking to experts uh, as many of these pop more of these populations as I can find. Like I said, I already have nine. There might be more in Southern Nevada, uh, and finding as many of those as I can, uh, and then actually, as I said, preparing myself physically to be able to go out you know into habitat with a pack that weighs you know a decent amount uh, of weight on my back uh, and travel the long distances in the quick and the short amount of time that I need to uh, to be able to survey as many of these agave utensils borospina plants as I possibly can. So I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. What do you hope to see out of Project Eborospina? Do you have any suggestions, you know, criticisms, feedback? What should I make sure I do when I'm out in habitat doing these surveys? What should I definitely not do when I'm doing these kind of surveys? Thanks for watching.